Okay, well we might we might make a start on this last session. I think um, one of the interesting things about this conference is that we're not necessarily drawing it to a close, but we're actually kind of pausing within uh, the process of, of, of this two-part conference, if you like. And I think the interesting thing about the structure is that there is enough distance between those two parts to actually reconceive of an agenda and take that agenda forward into the conference in Brisbane in February. And we're at the position now where actually it is about framing that conference. It's not as if a, a call of papers has gone out, but actually here is a chance to take stock, if you like, and begin to frame some issues. So I think the, the idea of this session is to talk through with you as participants of this first conference some of the issues that might frame uh, the questions that, that are raised uh, for the second conference. In order to do that, I thought I'd just very, very briefly um, give, I guess, my view of some of the thematics that have emerged out of the material as much by kind of coincidence and um, I think really the quality of the paper and the focus of individuals on the theme, yeah, as much by that as by a kind of design we might have had in terms of the grouping of the sessions. And I, I think there were some very persistent and consistent themes that emerged um, out of the material. I think the first one that struck me on the first day was really a focus around uh, the window and the idea of a window as a kind of interface. So initially from uh, the sort of 19th century uh, questions of window dressing and the, the window as, as a registered, as an object because of the landscape that was represented behind um, the fantastic kind of presentation in Sanders' paper of the re refrigerator as a kind of scene, as a kind of unfolding window. Though I must admit, um, when I opened my fridge this morning, I was confronted with more something more like a desert than, uh, than a kind of verdant scene. Um, and questions then, I think, also by the end of today, are of a kind of question of the screen, and that might be the film screen, such as in, in Eleanor's paper, which gives a view but also provides a surface. And so even in that contemporary project, my mind right, went right back to sort of Anka's examples from the, from the 19th century of this ambiguity between where we were looking at, where we were looking through, and then what is the status of the screen. And then, really, the question of, of flow was in some ways supplanted by the question of, of, a, of a seam. Not so much a barrier, but a question of a seam which had to be negotiated. And Pat's paper this morning describing those moments actually of confusion when in some ways you, you come up against what a screen or a seam when you should be thinking that it's about flow. So it's as a stoppages or interruptions that the status of that screen or seam uh, introduces into the argument. So I think in a very critical and interesting way it wasn't simply about an acceptance of flow, but the problematics of flow, the kinds of um, issues of scene that we need to think about also at the same time as flow. Not simply a stoppage, but a question of negotiation. Um, issues then, I think, were brought around uh, the thickening of that seam through questions of envelope and the introduction of themes of atmosphere, especially in, in Sandra's paper, and also, I thought, um, particularly Joel's paper, and that project around, uh, project around the Olympics that folded up a kind of envelope of a landscape around the stadium that was both forming but also kind of hiding. So this sort of idea of a thickening envelope that had, would contain or would have within it a kind of question of atmosphere, but potentially also the technologies of atmosphere that take up space within and around interiors, um, and issues of microclimate, variability of atmosphere in some of those contemporary projects. A further theme, I think, was one of mobility and enclosure. We ne and we never got mobility without forms of enclosure. So if we think of George Bernard Shaw's writing hut, an incredibly tight enclosed space that was actually movable, that would follow and track the sun on its kind of rails, and then, of course, the train carriages that would move through the landscape. But the question there was as much containment as it was mobility. So once again, it's not simply flow. It's about a certain containing that enables flow. And finally, perhaps, with the Leverance uh, and Aspland example, a larger question of in containment around the landscape's containment, that, that the landscape is registered through containment rather than extension, necessarily. Um, and certainly in the, that sort of question of the garden that arose as well today, that mid-scale question of a garden that is a contained space between a kind of micro-scale and a larger uncontained urban scale. So ideas of window, scene, 
envelope atmosphere, mobility and enclosure and, and con the containment of landscape, I think, kind of emerged out of the material. Um, that, so that's the sort of initial set of observations I might make that, that we might unpack. But the second thing I want to say is that um, notionally we thought of this first conference as a kind of historical conference on historical material, and that's certainly borne out by uh, the focused research work that we saw presented. But actually, it was very clear right from the beginning um, that the questions that were posed to that material very often were questions about a kind of relationship to designing as an activity. So I, I was thinking, and I, I might draw Joel out on this in a moment, um, the question he asked about the drapes on the very first morning clearly, for me at least, came from a certain position of looking at that material and making it live for the, for the design question around the problematics of the window, for example. So already, I think, from the very beginning, we had this relationship to a question of design and practice that was not about uh, a division between historical material that's purely of scholarly interest and material that is made live for a kind of practice concern. To me, that's one of the most interesting um, ways in which we've already mix up, mixed up this schema of the two conferences, and very, very productively so, I think. Um, and that if, if the historical material is doing anything, and I think all of the material presented is doing this, it's, it's made live, and it's made live in terms of questions of design as process, what we would call, I guess, practice. And I think that's the part of the initiative of the second conference is to engage those ideas. But we might think about actually how we think of the, the activation of this historical material because we would ask particular questions of it. Um, and I, mi I might actually, because I've already primed him for this, throw open to, over to Joel maybe for him to respond to that question of, of, of how you would ask a question that relates to a practice concern sort of of this material and maybe some reflections on, on how we saw that unfold. Uh, well, you asked me, a, you're kind of putting me on the spot. But you pri you spot. primed me that you would, I but you I confess to being so jet lagged that I'm not sure <laughs> I'll be very useful. But, um, but I guess my, my thoughts in general are these that it, my understanding is that Flow 2 is, is kind of picking up on these issues, but looking at it through the lens of contemporary practice. Mm -hmm. And I guess I thought you would ask like what would be some possible ways we could proceed. Yeah. And I guess one most obvious example would be uh, perhaps to produce a kind of forum for a kind of interdisciplinary dialogue, perhaps you know, getting uh, contemporary practitioners from different disciplines to kind of discuss the, the joys and the kind of trials and tribulations of, of interdisciplinary practice. I guess with my understanding, and I hope I'm not projecting that not only my wish, but the wish of this conference is to kind of promote uh, much more of a kind of productive dialogue between landscape and, and interiors in particular. Um, I think another thing one clearly could do is, is uh, create a place where provocative contemporary practitioners are there to kind of show their work and to begin to sort of chart the, and map the, the kind of things that are happening all over the world, because they are. But, but thirdly, and it gets back to maybe what you were talking about, this kind of activation of, of, of historical material, which I think already began to happen. And maybe it's just asking the people in this room and other people to maybe talk uh, in a more um, in, uh, uh, instrumental strategic way about how the questions that they raise that are historical questions sort of shed light upon or, 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 or recurring themes that um, impact contemporary practice. And Sandra and I were gossiping before and both kind of, I, I'm the old curmudgeon here and I'm always sort of complaining that my students often, you know, they, they think that they've invented this, these things from nowhere or their contemporaries did. And indeed, there is nothing entirely new under the sun. And so, I mean, I, I guess I was reflecting on some of the themes that I think have occurred today that at least I think directly impact on practitioners like myself. Um, for example, um, this whole question of, of uh, flow. I mean, we've been talking about that all day. But um, I, again, I'm thinking about this morning is 
it, is there a kind of critique of this kind of interest in, 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 in flow? Or are we actually positing that there's actually a historical, uh, a kind of alternative history, an unwritten history, that, that perhaps makes us understand that at their, at the, at when they were practicing, let's say, the kind of case study architects, that they were already aware of the kind of contradictions and paradoxes of indoor outdoor, that this, this dream was never really such a pure dream after all, right? Um, that's kind of, kind, of, kind of one thought to think about. I think this question of agency and authorship and design and what role um, design can play for contemporary practice. And there, I think some themes that I did think emerged today that I do think reflect on contemporary practice that, that actually are historically resonant is this notion that I think um, contemporary practitioners, I think many of them are looking for ways that escape, let's say, agency or authorship. And, uh, and it could be through sort of digital automatic design practices or it could be uh, through appealing to science. But again, I mean, there's nothing new under the sun and that kind of, th th that kind of urge, those kinds of desires have a long history and I think it might be um, interesting and illuminating for for the historians here to begin to maybe think 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 about um, that. Yeah. And um, there was one other thought. Also, I was thinking of Robin's paper this morning and this idea of critical regionalism. And again, he was again talking about it from a historian's perspective from a particular moment in history. But as I was looking at it, I was thinking again how so many of the images in the slides he showed us and so many of the images you've all shown, you know, were kind of food for thought, were fodder that could sort of um, uh, 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 be a kind of catalyst for creativity for contemporary architects, right? Because we know that so many contemporary architects are looking to, towards indigenous architects or non-Western, we talked about that, sources that try to kind of straddle or cre create a kind of balance between the global and the local. You know, it's so much in the air, but again, it happened historically, and I think so many people today, you know, seem rather unfamiliar with those trajectories. And I have to say that Sandy's paper, I'm, I was going to, I'll, I'll ask him publicly, I want him to send me all of his images, so many of his <laughs> images, because, I mean, it, it, to talk about nothing new under the sun, there were like 17 things you showed that I thought I was so fucking smart that I showed my client, like that indoor outdoor bathroom, I mean, 16 things. It was all done before, right? And and, and it just was, right? Uh, or your discussion of the 60s and, and, and the bubble and thinking about how the kind of sense of desperation and urgency that we have e from, from an ecological perspective, it was just the kind of, in a certain way, we're revisiting the problems that the 60s confronted so specifically. And again, I'm the old curmudgeon here, but I'm just shocked that my students have absolutely no idea that happened. And that's like, you know, <laughs> my own history. Yeah. Shows how old. So it's a long-winded way of saying that maybe we can ask these questions that we've asked today, but maybe looking at them more literally and specifically yeah. of how they recur and might inform, you know, uh, uh, trajectories of, of yeah. co contemporary practice. I, and immediately, there's a kind of question of format, actually. I think implied in some of what you're saying of structure. But I'd like to actually pick up on this idea um, and kind of maybe throw it to the panel. Um, is there or has there emerged, do you think, or would, would one be looking for out of this a kind of alternative history of flow or a critique of something that, that has been established? Um, and so, can, or, you know, taking up the call in a sense, is, is, it, is it kind of to be written, as it were, out of this material potentially that may address some of the kind of questions about actually what we're excavating at you is we're excavating a kind of set of concerns that are very much contemporary and that there might be this kind of alternative or unwritten history of flow. I think one, just thing, which is one thing to say which perhaps has been a bit subliminal is we did organise the programme chronologically yes. loosely. Yeah. So we did take ourselves like, through late 19th century into early modernism and modernism and beyond, which I kind of forgot in really, but it, it's interesting because I think some of the themes take on different um, subtleties or, or meanings differently through the period. It might, I'd quite like to go back and retract that. You know, there's, there's, there's some of the things, there's co so contradictory things going on, I thought, sometimes within the 19th century 
things meant one thing and they meant something quite different or they stood on their head within modernism and then probably stood on their head again when they got revisited in late modernism. So I, I'm going to go through all my notes and see if I can pick those things up. But it may be that there may be a sort of almost a trajectory where you can kind of almost go, well, what next? Or, or I think your question about where, what are we looking back at and why? You know, I, I think um, Sandy's picture of the flowers around that window you showed is incredibly historical, but not, not, there's something, there's something resonant about it in, t- in today's world. Not, and you can pick on those images which you think yeah, they're resonant, and certainly the the West Coast modernism is what well, occurred three or four times, so it's, it's, it's so potent. But I'd like to know why. Mm. I think so. The other thing that was going through my mind that during, the, uh, during the last couple of days, I thought that the the thing, this idea of flow as some sort of tran- transitional or, or, or space in transition or environment in transition somehow, I thought was quite dangerous in terms of the sort of tradition of architectural and design history in the sense that it for me, it started to question and open up things. I mean, especially the work that Pat was showing, you know, that, that, that questioning of those Im- the images mm-hmm. and, and the assumptions that are made about these spaces once you really question them when you're right on that sort of edge of space between inside and outside. And it seems to, that, it, that it, I felt it was almost opening up another trajectory, another kind of reading of. Mm, it was. But that was how I, you mm, know. I agree. Through and I think, I have to say, that I think that Modernism is still rather it's core to all of this discussion, isn't yeah, it? And perhaps yeah. we ought to just question that. But, uh, but then again, I don't know, we're not really over modernism. I mean, you know. No, I think that's the point, really. Modernity, <laughs> you know, this this yeah. just really reinforces that yeah. for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was just going to say, I think there's another thing, and I think Joel really brought it up as well, that we haven't been, that everybody's really spoken about, and it is actually interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, mm. however, this isn't. And, that's, and is it a problem? I mean, the slightly problematized in some ways, and in other ways, it's it's seen as a, a very great advantage and an opening up of practice. And I think that's been un- being underpinned everywhere. And it's the relationship between you know, technology, who is practicing what, and not simply design practice. It's actually a whole range of practices. And so, um, I suppose if we're talking about another history, an alternative history of flow. Mm. Um, it's actually about the act, action of practice, and I think that idea of actually inviting practices in um, to start to have this dialogue is a really interesting one as well. So. I wonder, though, what the anchor points of that might be, um, mm-hmm. and whether there are, um, you know, one, one doesn't want to set it up as it were that they've kind of developed this historic material, mm-hmm. we've worked out this kind of presents an alternative thing, and it's like, well, make something of it. You know, I'm, I'm wondering how we, and, and I guess I would kind of open up to, to responses from the audience about like the kind of position, you know, the, the, the f- question of format, because I think that's really like how, how you construct that dialogue yeah. or relationship. Yeah. One thing I'd be really interested in is whether people in the audience, or people who have actually done presentations or not, what they think their next presentation is going to be. Are they coming out to visit us <laughs> with <laughs> the next bit? Yeah. You know? I mean, I think there is, that is actually a, 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 there's a continuity. Uh, um, there's a couple of things that kind of come up repeatedly. Uh, over the last two days. Admittedly, I haven't been here for all these sessions, which I apologise for. But um, one of them, which particularly came out for me quite clearly at the end of uh, Joel's discussion earlier, uh, was the issue of scale and the way that uh, flow, and particularly if we're talking about turning this from something that's historical and academic into something that has a bearing on practice, is the understanding of scale and, and the correct understanding of scale, particularly as a relationship between an interior and an exterior, where there is a, there is a presumption of a, a difference in scale that I think was problematized um, by the presentation about the uh, wooden cemetery. So that, so that notion of kind of, you know, what is, the in, what is an interior and, um, and what is an enclosure and what isn't. So at one end, you, you were talking about the difference between an interior and the notion of the, the cemetery as an enclosed space, as a, as a form of interior. Uh, 
And if you go back to the, you know, the origins of the very word park, it comes from uh, the notion of emparkment. So actually, as you were saying, with the very early um, uh, Mughal gardens, that notion of the first thing you do is actually you demarcate an area that, that, that that's the start of the garden and that's actually the start of development. So you've got, you've got that notion of scale at one end, but you've also, uh, going back to Joel's talk, got the notion of scale at the other end and this issue, this problematic issue around the wilderness and the, and the role of the wilderness as a, as a metaphor, but also as a kind of um, something that really guides certain types of practice. So you've got that, that notion of scale where there's a flow along that kind of continuum on a conceptual level. But I also think as a practitioner, particularly if you work in an interdisciplinary team with engineers, landscape architects and architects, that different understanding of scale in terms of who is responsible for what, what's the correct purview of architecture, what's the correct purview of landscape and interiors, and, and, and where do those issues kind of overlap or not, and, 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 and what's the difference, what's, what ends up being the difference in a way a project is executed, for example, whether it's a master plan or, you know, a building or whatever it might be, when you have different disciplines with very different understandings of scale. So I, I, I kind of, I don't know whether there's a connection between flow between an interior and an exterior and flow between different notions of scale in, in that sense. I hope that's not too banal. And then, uh, and then just another thing is that there were lots of, uh, particularly in the discussion around the refrigerators and, and all the images of windows, but also in the connection with the film that was shown, the, 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 that particular type of film reminded me very much of Claude lenses and going back to that notion of the picturesque and that notion of having a conceptual but also a physical frame that enables the user not only to participate in a way in the active in to, to, to actively engage in the construction of landscape, whether that's by placing a frame around a painting or holding a lens up to a landscape and creating a view and a scene in that way, but also that, that use of framing through windows and you know there are there are continuities there about kind of how those frames are used and how they're also used by the designer in a way to try and or the artist or the architect to create a view but also how they can be used by users or consumers or you know kind of so I don't know if there are any connections there at all so I, so for me it was very much kind of that framing notion and also scale which might kind of offer a link between theory and practice. I mean, I, could I add something to that? Because I think always in looking at scale, physical scale, it's really interesting, rather like in a music score, to look at time as a scale as well. So to have that sitting alongside your comments about physical scale, and there's something about the time-based work or the measurement of time, and permanence and impermanence in all of these situations which becomes really interesting not just in design but also in making or projecting or dreaming I think that becomes very interesting and and I think Alice just left but I'm, oh no she's there she came back because I when you said dream earlier on in, as a comment about dreaming, I immediately put observatory down as well because that was something about the sort of subjective and the objective notion of looking and projecting that I think might, might feed into this discussion. Mm. I, I want to um, actually pick up on the, this, this idea that you had of uh, what, what you would present next. Uh, and I saw Sandra's hand shoot up, so I might, I might kind of have the mic passed along, potentially. Is there another mic? Just, just down there, just down here. Not so much just what I would present next, but what I'd like to see other people, people present, present yeah. next. So I was thinking about how you might transfer, say, the very close 
looking the anchor did in terms of curtains and the drawings that um, upholsterers were doing to say the context of a Westfield shopping centre and the drapery around objects in a shop window. You know, a current kind of proposal and practice. How would you, what would she find taking those, the very, you know, I thought that was a very beautiful paper with that very, very careful, careful focus and move it onto a, a contemporary subject where perhaps one's seeing the same relationships or perhaps not in terms of framing and curtain and image making. So, you know, I, I, I felt like assigning subject Tasks. matter to <laughs> so, for myself, I, I'm, the, the mm. conference has stimulated to, for me a realisation that really there needs to be more work on bureau landschaft and the, the, the bringing in of the pot plants within the vast <laughs> office landscape <laughs> and the kind of flow of industry around the pot plants that develops out of that, that there are you know, whole companies devoted to pot plants and their, their cycle through the office. You know, I'm sure there's a paper in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I think Penny's... Yeah, Penny's yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we could draw Penny on that, I'm sure. But Anka, did you um, want to...? I wanted to... I just want to make sure that I'm holding this at the right distance. Um, follow up on your um, connection between holsters and department stores in that actually, um, as, as I was um, talking to Charles earlier on, um, I do think about that already and I have an entire chapter that I'm, I barely finished about two months ago about um, how department stores in the 19th century, because that's what I'm primarily interested in, um, dealt with, with the same kinds of images and the same kinds of materials that they were proposing to the general public. So they too were selling curtains and you have curtains being sold by department stores in a very similar way through catalogs, like you see these upholsters advertising their um, wares, so to say, in books. So it's not only a question of the department store window, which itself also became very theatrical and had many draperies and gold and mannequins and things like that, but also other venues, like, as I said, catalogs and printed advertisements that people have not so much looked at in terms of um, visual practice, but rather looked at in terms of social history, for instance. Um, so my next paper, if it gets accepted, um, <laughs> I proposed for um, the CIA, which has to do exactly with this question of how do you um, try to sell an entire interior to the public and whether the public would buy it or not. And then moving on from there, the idea of the total work of art where you have um, architects and decorators and collectors all together trying to um, combine their different perspectives and come up with this one specific object, which is or, or space, which is the interior. And so far, people have been writing about Art Nouveau um, in that respect, but even before, way before, people were thinking about how do you combine different practices and what does a decorator do versus what does an architect do versus what does an upholster do um, for that matter and how their sort of interests overlap. So mm. that's something that I would like to see being followed up um, next time. I wonder if though there, if there's also the very practical kind of um, question in that when we're talking about practice actually what practices do we imagine might be interested in the proposal for flow two. I mean, it, it, do we assume a kind of interest from interiors and architecture, or do we actually say no? It should be fine art. It should be, it should be, um, you know, uh, office organisation. It should be logistics. You know, well, what are the practices that, that 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 might be enticed that could be involved? I think some of the practices that might be involved might be things that are happening in sort of new media. I, mean, I was thinking particularly of things like television and film. You know, I mean. I'm sort of halfway through a paper where I've been looking at desperate housewives. No, not, <laughs> not what you're thinking why I'm looking at them, but the movie, you know, the sort of television series, which is different. Um, because of the way they, they, they sort of play games with colour, 
coordination between surfaces and people and they break continuities in order to keep the colour coordination working in different environments. And I think that that's a really interesting sort of way of sort of rethinking sort of space and, and, and time, you know. And so, so these people are doing that and I don't know where they're basing it on. I'm not sure what, you know, theoretical frameworks they follow, but it's certainly, you know, a, a shift in, in the way sort of thinking's occurring. So, it seems to me in those kinds of worlds, you know, you know, there might be, be things. I'm not sort of worried about, you know, um, period kind of um, costumes and sets, but the way sort of these n these n newer, more interesting kind of productions work. I don't know. Yeah. Sandy, yeah. Yeah. I definitely think history should be <laughs> included, yeah. but I also I would also. Um, uh, almost in a, just to join Joel and curmudgeonry, um, s there, the unexamined term here seems to be flow. And, and not just in this room, but you know, it strikes me how powerful a metaphor this is across a range of, um, across practices and within um, certain practices. And that, you know, to a historian, that's often a, the little, you know, bell goes off that this is something to investigate that's probably deeply time bound mm -hmm. and will look um, quite retrograde 10 or 15 years from now as hard as it is to imagine ourselves outside that. So I think that that suggestion that there be a, a critique of flow, um, not necessarily just, you know, to judge it, but simply to look at it in some sort of historical context um, could be something quite useful. It, it, it's almost as if it makes permanent the state of change that modernism proposed at first to embrace. You know, and and it, it instantiates that as a permanent oh, that's, that's the point I was trying mm. to make. Exactly. It's, it's rooted in a moment, in an ideological moment. Isn't yeah. it? I mean, w was there a way in which you had conceived of flow as a title and actually now it's your conception of it may be either reconceived or, or questioned. I mean it's interesting to see actually how the word, yeah. the title may remain but actually the, the conception of it has shifted because of what we've heard today. Maybe a question mark goes after it? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Possibly. Mm. I think it's, uh, one of the things that strikes me is that this whole um, moment that we're having here has come out of a series of conversations. Um, that are about exchange, actually. Mm -hmm. And flow came, we, I mean, we were concerned yeah. about inside, outside, and the fact that, you know, that, that's, that all, that's very limited in some senses. If you just look at sure. know, what's inside and what's outside, it's okay, you can describe it. But flow seemed to bring up a whole series of social and yeah. cultural mm -hmm. perspectives, and it promised it. And the other thing that was struck, struck, struck me that we've been actually looking at this <laughs> poster and we had an enormous discussion around the image, <laughs> the selection of the image that would go with flow and this, this was the one that actually you know, spoke to us because it's actually topographical. It's, um, it actually has a whole sense of, of are you inside, are you outside, the, the voyeur, the, the fact that it's um, uninhabited but it has the presence of habitation mm. once had a whole range of very multi um, uh, I don't know, the image actually speaks multitudes mm. and you can read it in a multi in many many ways and, but we had many other ways of thinking through this mm. so I'm not sure where I'm going with this but I actually I'm, I'm, I guess I'm returning back to the image and the idea that um, the conversations that, that around the image and around some of these um, elements that you're bringing out, um, we can actually picture in our minds, um, and we've got a series of prompts for us, but it is actually about exchange of, of ideas, of knowledge, of histories um, that seem to be one of the key things that was in our original yeah, conversation. It was that, that, that motivated yeah. it. I think the other thing that Joel addressed very clearly in his talk is the fact that, that the Kingston we've been focusing on the interior, very much because we, we felt the last 10 years the interior has been less well 
theorise, discuss and architecture, and that, that's the starting point. And, and landscape has exactly the same issue. So it was the joining up of those two, really, for that reason. Um, and obviously, you can't have any of this discussion without discussing architecture. It's not to, to leave it out, but it is to, t to, to attempt to, to not reprioritize, but to sort of look at the hierarchy and, and question the hierarchy. And I think that idea of kind of bringing people together into this plenary of notion, possibly of team working, and what that means in terms of different skills coming together would, would be really interesting to try and address. Mm. I don't quite know how you get mm, the yeah, I mean, I'm not sure of, but. I think the, 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 the technical aspects yeah. have actually become quite tricky in a yeah, way. I yes. I mean, what, one of the things is, uh, and, and another conversation is this kind of translation of, of languages across practices. Mm -hmm. um, this is purely a personal yeah, thing, but I've been spending the last 18 months, I suppose, working with scientists. And the thing that we had to do around this landscape, which was both an interior landscape and, and a broader landscape, is a waterhole is actually to find a language through practice and through actually immersion in being in this, in this waterhole. And it's been a fantastic journey for all of us because we've got different kinds of languages. And there seems to be a new practice coming out of it from their perspective and from, from, the, la from the design perspective around, around this a sense of exchange around a locale or a space. And, um, and, and maybe new practices come out of it maybe new ways of thinking about mm -hmm. um, associations might come out of the next one. Um, mm -hmm. I think that notion of place, I think that came up particularly yeah. in, in yeah. what Chris was saying. And I, I, was really, I thought that was really interesting, the idea that you were sort of suggesting that the landscape and interior are both very specific about place in the way that architecture as a frame might not be quite the same. Brenda? The, um, Penny's just arrived at a point. Um, for me, something I'd like to um, probe more is the disruption of the public and the private, which once we get the transition of spaces and materials and, and everything, the sense of place across the inside and the outside. In quite a few of the papers all the way through, there was a disruption of, of what we perceive as public and private, and that was upset. So maybe that's something we could explore at the next conference interdisciplinary teams were actually formed mm -hmm. to to discuss maybe precisely these issues and that may, maybe there's some way of actually you know grouping people together in a way so that they work together to actually mm -hmm. present something in some way that not only reflects the different languages and different perspectives that each of their disciplines have, how that can actually enrich everyone's understanding of the subject exactly in the way that you were describing in terms of working with scientists, but also in a way that actually also interrogates kind of those different prejudices that different disciplines have that sometimes it's difficult to move beyond in those in those environments. You can see a proposal coming up. Maybe, I don't know whether we can actually do that at the conference, but it might end up with a, well, I almost see a sort of manifesto mm. coming up, mini, ma mini manifesto, that might have a proposal about a research project that might do something like that. I, I just lent the cross to Ginny and said, I think we need a whopping ARC grant. <laughs> <to do this. laughs> so yeah, we yeah, might need more than six mind. months. <laughs> 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 I mean, because uh, what's being suggested actually is something about the conference format. Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. You know, um, and and you know, to, to try and reinvent the conference format is, is you know, enough of a task. It's a challenge. Yeah, it's a yes. challenge. It's a challenge. You, can't, yeah, you can't do it all. Yeah. That sounds really interesting, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the light of work that's ongoing in other contexts, mm. and certainly the interface studio that coincidentally has a, a, a similar name to, well, same two words as, as Joel was describing, working with practitioners coming from very different kinds of areas of practice. There are all kinds of ways of communicating that, and language is definitely a key. And I think it, the format could be something that would be a really exciting mm. Diagram, even if, if it's a, you know initially a diagram of mm. how one occupies the time that one has assigned, mm. 
yes. that becomes spatial and <laughs> all yeah. kinds of things in itself and how on that gets recorded and a kind of continuity of mm. discussion. Yeah, because I mean, as much as language there are expectations around forms of engagement that are seen to be productive or not seen to be productive. Mm -hmm. And there would have to be some quite a lot done bit up ahead, up ahead. Uh, to yeah. make yeah. value of time yeah. assigned. And I think also questions of outcome. I mean, in, in the sort of traditional academic for, mm -hmm. format, you know, of, of paper, you know, it's easy to understand, okay, and the next step to a question of outcome. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of in this new reality here in the UK around research and questions of, of impact. Mm -hmm. That is impact of the research outside of the yeah. academic community, which immediately brings with it the question of format. Absolutely. In what way does your research is in what way is your research received? Who are you addressing? Who are you addressing, and in what form are you addressing? Yeah. Because the two are related. It's not that um, suddenly practitioners read our read our uh, yeah. anthologies or, or journal papers necessarily, but actually the, f the mode of address, the format, yeah. which I think is tied then to the the structure of the of the event, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so you know those two things I think are, are um, could uh, could I think we could try something. I mean mm -hmm. I think. You don't reinvent. You don't come up with a new type of conference that addresses everything. But but that sort of attempt. And you know, I did quite like the idea that Sandra just raised of, uh, raised of almost assigning tasks. You know, in in, in potential things that, that could be interesting. One of the things we have discussed is whether or not we have a, a an exhibition of some sort that attached to it. Whether or not part of the part of the creative output is actually both the paper and an exhibition. Mm -hmm. Um, which actually... The yeah, visual work. Uh, so the visual, visual work, work. Um, in some way, mm. uh, which could be very interesting and useful uh, mm. as a collection of the collective works of both. Mm. So the, the call, the invitation could also be uh, for an exhibition piece, a performance piece, as well as, as, as a paper. Or perhaps the paper is that you're not allowed to talk. Or, uh, you could ask people not to talk about their own work, but to talk about the exhibition work almost on the spot. Yeah. That kind of instant, you know, that sort of jury type question could be. So it's because I think part of the issue is that, you know, one, one, one has one's own work and then there's a format for the delivery of that in the paper. But if to really cross over forms of expertise, one might have to ask people to talk about other things. And that, that, that always then raises the question of framework. You know, one, one's approach then always becomes foregrounded when, when it gets applied, as it were. Mm -hmm. And then the capturing of a discussion after that might be actually the outcome, in a way. I mean, there are two audiences, I mean, beyond the academic, but one could think of obviously practice, practitioners, but also the pedagogic aspect. Yes, yeah, which absolutely. One might have yeah. different things for different audiences. Mm -hmm. so. Can I ask you in relation to outcome whether you're planning to do anything with the material mm -hmm. at the conference? But from here, say, from yeah. here. We were, but um, our initial thoughts were, and it may be that the time frame, I don't know, is too long or not, we haven't discussed it probably, was to have two conferences and then to have a, some collective output. Because that does mean that it's over a long time, but that was the aim initially, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rather than have something now and then something later. Yeah. A book or something. Or yeah, that you know, summed up the two. And that's, and that's the idea that, that flow is actually also a generator. Mm -hmm. You know, it's beyond, uh, it, you know, it, also, it has what it's had today is, is you come and you present the work that, that you've been doing. But now there's the opportunity to present, to, to develop this work in another way or, mm -hmm. and so there could be two outputs or a range of things. As, as a, and so this is, the getting together and the exchange is actually generating is generational. But I know we still have to answer ERA and... <laughs> REF and... Yeah, I've forgotten the New Zealand one, but that seems important as well. Is there... Are there some, maybe some final... Uh, uh, if there's a final plea or suggestion or... The other thing was we talked about things like this. Okay. Well, I think at this point we're probably at the end of our... Oh, the one, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say that the other thing that we have talked about prior to this, and I think it was, Sandra just remind, was prompted by that when she talked about kind of the shopping malls and that, is that we have talked, because the, the spaces that are omit, omitted from our discussion so far, which are also impacting on practice, are things like sort of super modern, 
spaces that we're generating, the large sort of shopping malls, the airports, and all these other kinds of spaces. And when I see people currently doing research into airports, it's uh, you know it's it's a kind of quasi scientific way of dealing with efficiency and economy rather than sort of examining them from any sort of critical historical or even regional kind of idea about how we deal with them and and, and certainly some of that work's happening in Milan. And yeah, that's right. We, that's why we, we discussed it, wasn't we, it? Because in Milan, there's a very strong emphasis on that we might invite yeah, those right. people to come and do that. Right. But again, you know, to start looking very closely at those sorts of spaces might be another way of engaging with kind of the, the current practice of, of producing new buildings rather than necessarily examining or working with historical ones or one pre you know existing ones. I mean it may be that the yeah. logistics consultants are precisely the people we need yeah, to bring in. Exactly. I mean it may be that approach or or the, the kind of pot plant um, emporium. Well, the, yeah. interior you know, or the, inter the interior scapers. Or the interior you know that. I've never met an interior scaper, but I want yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, I mean we, we could bring them in under false pre pretenses and line them up and interrogate them. I mean that could be one way, one mm -hmm. way of doing it. Um, but I think probably we've reached a point where I mean it's incredibly useful feedback I think, and it's mm -hmm. a, such a nice position to be in to be being able to plan something that's a continuation. Um, but I think um, I, I'd like to thank, uh, I guess on behalf of, of all of us, the organisers of the conference, Penny, Pat, Mark and Jeannie, the real organisers of the conference, Fiona Fisher and Patricia. And our visiting professors to the centre, uh, Alice Friedman and Pat Kirkham, and our keynotes, Sandy Zestat and Joel Sanders. And everyone who presented such fantastic papers with, with a very, uh, in my experience, very seldom do you get such coherence and such focus on, on a set of topics. So it's been incredibly enjoyable. So thank you all very much.